Good morning, everyone. Welcome again to this course in history of English language and literature. And today's session, we begin talking about this perhaps this greatest figure, not in Elizabethan literature itself, but in world literature itself, William Shakespeare. Shakespeare is perhaps the best known literary writer of not just his period, but also of the entire world literature. And in fact, many of you might know that even the ones who have got little inclination towards theatre, uh, poetry or any kind of literary writing might have heard about Shakespeare. That is the kind of impact that he has had on not just in literature, but also in world culture for the last few centuries. And in fact, when we begin talking about uh, William Shakespeare, one of the first things that comes to our mind is who is William Shakespeare? Let us begin with some uh, very uh, trivial details about the scholarship on uh, Shakespeare. Uh, in fact, there is a lot of uh, uh, mystery about who really Shakespeare was and what uh, kind of an author he was in the sense that the absence of historical records has made his uh, personality, his uh, corpus of writing quite mysterious in terms of actual authorship. In fact, uh, uh, a particular branch of study itself exists in uh, uh, English literary studies uh, known as author authorship studies, which uh, debates and deliberates upon the actuality of Shakespeare's writing, uh, whether Sh Shakespeare actually wrote those plays or not. In fact, some of those uh, are concerns about uh, the various disputes about authorship. We also looked at in the previous session when we uh, engaged with the university wits in general. So, um, that is about the uh, debates about Shakespeare's authorship, but in this lecture we move on with the assumption which most of the recent historians also share that Shakespeare himself actually wrote most of the most of his plays. Maybe there were collaborations, maybe there were lost plays, but nevertheless the man did exist and his dramatic genius is beyond uh, question. So, we move ahead with this assumption. And another interesting uh, trivia about his uh, personality, uh, some of you might have uh, noticed this opening scene in the movie Shakespeare in Love, where he tries to put his signature in many different ways. This detail in the movie is actually based, from, based on facts and that is very interesting given the fact that the man who penned almost 37 plays and a number of sonnets and a few other uncredited and uh, lost uh, plays. Maybe he had a problem in spelling his name correctly. So, uh, this is uh, an instance of about six examples of Shakespeare's own handwriting, which historians have recovered from signatures from legal documents. These were mostly contracts that he signed with particular uh, acting companies, and uh, one is from his will. And very interestingly, there is no standard spelling that uh, the uh, linguistic experts and handwriting experts could uh, uh, discover from there is varied kinds of uh, uh, signatures that Shakespeare is said to have used. So, these are the different spellings that he himself perhaps uh, had been using and uh, even the veracity of these signatures and whether Shakespeare himself actually signed them or whether he had another uh, clerk or doing all these jobs for him, it is not yet clear. But it is very interesting to note that during his own life, uh, uh, during his own lifetime, the standard spelling that we now use William Shakespeare was never used. Uh, he himself never had used it and we, don't, we do not find any other records using his uh, name with this spelling either. So, in that sense it was a very interesting uh, and a very multifaceted kind of life that he led. So, uh, beyond these uh, many trivialities about his life and many disputes about his life, in uh, fact there are uh, there but, uh, but apart from these many trivialities about his life and these many dis disputes about historical uh, veracity. One needs to move on with the assumption that uh, as we said earlier, Shakespeare did exist and also his drama is of uh, supreme genius not just during the Elizabethan times, but in the world uh, class literature itself. These are some of the instances of the earlier manuscripts available, uh, which were published posthumously after his death and we do not find them using uh, the, uh, the spelling that we contemporarily use. So, moving on from that. We need to take a brief, uh, we need to take a brief look at his uh, early life and in fact, Shakespeare is said to have been born on 23rd April 1564 and I use the phrase said to have quite advisedly because there are no actual records of his birth available and there are church records of a baptism. So, in that sense, it is assumed that maybe he was born in and around uh, 23rd April in Stratford upon Avon. He was born as a son of an older man, so his childhood may not have been that difficult. He was one of the eight children of his father. 
and he is said to have ha uh, hailed from a fairly fa well to do family in that sense. So, maybe he also uh, this is the birthplace which is now a uh, center of tourist attraction in London and uh, he is also said to have enjoyed a fairly sound education in terms of schooling. He uh, perhaps went to this grammar school which was quite popular and quite decent in Stratford during these days. Uh, uh, during those days and uh, he may have been taught Latin and arithmetic, but there are no actual school records to prove whether he went or not. But there is this assumption that like all other children of his class, he may have enjoyed the sound education, but he was certainly not very learned in that sense. Uh, he never went to a university and he uh, when he uh, came to London as we noted even in the uh, discussion of university which he was uh, perhaps the only one who arrived in London with the hope of uh, making it big in theatre, making it big in writing without having had a university education. So, Ben Johnson, one of his contemporaries later wrote about him, he knew small Latin and less Greek. So, this is how he was looked uh, down upon by some of his more learned contemporaries, but uh, the ironical fact remains that he became more famous and more uh, achieved in terms of his literary merit and his dramatic uh, uh, craft at a later point of time. And uh, we get to know that financial misfortunes had overtaken his family. Uh, this was around 1577, but one does not know the real nature of the misfortunes and the circumstances in which his uh, childhood was based. But following that, perhaps uh, it was not an easy time for him. There are also some records which prove that he got married to Anne Hathaway in 1585. There are no actual marriage records, but one knows about this uh, marriage due to some available uh, records from the church and uh, there is a there, there's a record of baptism of uh, a daughter and a set of twins and one of them who also dies a little later and uh, uh, strangely enough by the time Shakespeare was of 21 years uh, uh, he had already fathered three children so it was not a, a easy life to begin with he had a lot of financial misfortunes and he was not really making it uh, big in that small town of Stratford and we find him leaving for London in 1587 and the reasons for taking off to London is not really known and some of the historians feel uh, that uh, he was uh, going to be arrested for poaching in somebody else's uh, uh, property. So, uh, one is not too sure whether he fled uh, Stratford for uh, London uh, in order to escape an impending arrest or whether he decided to deliberately move to London to pursue more fortunes over there. So, if we try and uh, record Shakespeare's journey to London from Stratford upon Avon, this is the kind of uh, journey that he had undertaken. So, uh, for a very long time we realize that when Shakespeare began to make it big in London, he used to uh, almost shift between uh, Stratford and London and some historians even fa feel that he led a double kind of a life because he was a very successful professional in London and but his uh, home uh, front always continued to be based in uh, Stratford. And if we talk about this uh, journey in terms of distance it is only 133 kilometers which um, uh, might uh, sound quite simple uh, today. But uh, during those days at Pat, as Pat Rogers the historian puts it, it was a, uh, a journey of several days unless you were rich and extravagant enough to hire post horses. So, we do not have any historical records to show that Shakespeare's family had moved to uh, London, but he uh, perhaps used to commute up and down, one is not too sure about the domestic details. So, in that sense he was a contemporary of the university wits as well about whose families also we have, uh, we do not know much about. Another thing is that one is not too sure about the exact year in which uh, Shakespeare arrived in London, the exact year in which he uh, started participating in theatrical activities so on and so forth. Pat Rogers says in what year exactly Shakespeare was drawn into the orbit of the metropolitan theatre we are not sure. So, we begin discussing his dramatic, uh, his dramatic career with this uncertainty, but there is uh, enough evidence that by 1592 he was writing and acting in London and he was fairly established and fairly well known in London circles by the time he uh, was at the age of 28. And we also recalled in the discussion of university wits that uh, there was this Robert Green who had uh, written quite unkindly about the arrival of a, a new fellow in uh, the London dramatic circles. So, this is perhaps uh, there is a conjecture that this is perhaps Shakespeare. So, in 1592 at the age of 28 he was 
uh, important enough to merit abuse from a famous playwright of the uh, period, Robert Greene. And by 1594, he uh, was one of the leading actors uh, in London, and there is enough evidence to show that he was uh, he had appeared with uh, William Kemp and Richard Burbage, who were. Uh, two of the major actors of those period. In fact, it is really said, generally said that during the Elizabethan times, many of them used to flock uh, these theatres to watch their favourite actors in stage. And in such a uh, within such a setting, for uh, some person like Shakespeare to make it really big in terms of acting abilities, in terms of his writing skills, in terms of his dramatic technique, that was quite an achievement. And by 1595, we know that he was in the payroll of Lord Chamberlain's company of actors. And this was, in fact, the most respectable and most coveted company uh, in Elizabethan times. And uh, they had the rare distinction of performing within the court. Uh, they, uh, there is even evidence that Shakespeare himself uh, had uh, performed in uh, front of the uh, queen herself a couple of times. So, uh, Lord Chamberlain's company uh, was the most well-known and Shakespeare uh, once he had uh, been part of Chamberlain's company, uh, we note that he had not performed or he had not written for any other company after that. And the same company was renamed as King's Men uh, after uh, James I takes over as the uh, King, of, uh, King of England. So, we also get to know uh, about which we shall be seeing in detail a little, la little later as well. We get to know that the theatre companies, their performances and everything continue to be at the mercy of uh, the government, the monarch, the uh, town council, so on and so forth. Many of these details we shall be coming back to when we look at uh, Elizabethan theatre in uh, detail. By 1597, there is evidence to show that he had already authored 15 of the 37 plays and that is quite a tremendous achievement for someone who had arrived in London with uh, very little fortune or very little prospects. Uh, if we survey his uh, career in uh, more detail. Uh, if you try to describe Shakespeare, he was not just a dramatist, he was not just a playwright, he was not just an actor, he was uh, many things uh, uh, put together. In fact, he was a theatre owner, he was an entrepreneur, he is considered as a very successful businessman who knew the market sense and who could cater to what the market want, wa wanted. So, in that sense, he is perhaps one of the first playwrights who realized the, uh, the, the, the kind of uh, success that one could reap out of uh, theatre and uh, literature in a more financial and revenue based terms. So, we can even call him as uh, one of the uh, one of the uh, dramatists who could come up with box office hits one after the other. And so, in that sense, Hudson in fact uh, refers to him as a practical man of affairs and he compares uh, Shakespeare with that of, uh, uh, he compares Shakespeare's genius with that of Chaucer and says he was no dreamer like Chaucer. And uh, this is uh, uh, proved by the fact that Shakespeare reached London poor and friendless, but by the time he left London, he was rich and he was respected and now we know England in fact owes much of its popularity, much, much of its, its cultural heritage to this uh, singular figure uh, William Shakespeare and uh, his uh, output was prolific. In fact, he was uh, he was the object of envy of most of his contemporaries because he was producing almost uh, uh, a couple of plays a year and uh, all of them were quite successful as well. So, in contemporary terms, if we think of a, a movie director who is coming up with at least two successful nationwide hits and that also if he repeats this success, he or she repeats this success one after the other in for many consecutive years, that is quite an achievement. So, this is what Shakespeare had. He achieved literary merit through this, he achieved the court's favour, he was popular and he was making a lot of money. So, by the time he uh, uh, begins to be uh, 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 quite an established figure in London, we know that he had amassed a lot of wealth and he had become extremely famous in London circles. And we uh, find him coming up as a very smart entrepreneur and a shrewd businessman as well. As soon as he realized the kind of revenues that these uh, theatres were uh, turning out, we find him becoming the shareholder of the two uh, shareholder of two very important uh, theatre companies, playhouses uh, of the period, uh, the Globe and the Blackfriars. So, this is how the uh, structure of the Globe looked like. When we, uh, we, we can already see that this is a quite a massive structure, it is very elaborate. In fact, it is uh, quite elaborate than the playhouses of uh, uh, today. So, uh, we will be looking at uh, uh, the, all of these technical features in detail when we talk about Elizabethan uh, drama. 
So, there is also evidence to show that he purchased property in uh, Stratford in London and in that sense he is also one of the earliest figures in uh, uh, London to be uh, realize the potential of uh, uh, real estate dealing. So, we find him investing heavily in property and also you know he could identify uh, and also he had an eye for this market, eye for business. So, we find him becoming extremely successful and extremely famous even during his lifetime. But this, uh, his life was uh, not just a bed of uh, uh, roses. We find a lot of domestic uh, tragedies hitting him one after the other. He is, uh, in fact, his uh, dramatic career is also marred by uh, continuous deaths in his family. His son dies initially, followed by his father, his younger brother Edmund, who was also an actor in London. And his mother also dies in 1607. And this had a major impact on his uh, career and his uh, uh, personal life in general. By 1610, we find him uh, quietly retiring back to Stratford upon Avon. And when he goes back to Stratford, uh, if you remember uh, earlier when he had left for London, he had to almost flee London because he, there was an impending arrest perhaps or maybe he was running away from the misfortunes that had fallen him and his family. But when he goes back as a uh, goes back to London uh, to retire and spend some quiet time over there, he's the richest man over there. We find him purchasing the largest house in Stratford and uh, settling over there. And uh, just like his entire life was clouded in mystery in certain ways, his death is also quite uh, uh, mysterious. He is said to have again died on 23rd April 1616, uh, which happens to be the documented birthday of uh, William Shakespeare as well. This is also again a conjecture because there are burial records which show that he was buried on 25th April. So, uh, uh, given the conventions of the day, the uh, burial used to happen two days after death. So, there is this conjecture that he was born on 23rd April and he died on 23rd April as well. And talking about Shakespeare's uh, uh, genius, it was uh, uh, there was no way in which one could compare him to his uh, contemporaries because he had no university education and he was not uh, he did not have the kind of background that many of the others uh, other literary uh, writers of those period uh, had. And his learning and his, and his learning and his craft, it was not the reflection of the trained and accurate scholar. In fact, we find him gathering knowledge, gathering life material from different sources and it is a very uh, miscellaneous assortment of uh, different kinds of experiences we find at a later point. And uh, at the same time, he was not uh, free from the influences of his times, uh, his plays reflect a uh, very strong influence of the classicism of the renaissance period and also we get to know that he had access to a lot of ancient uh, Greek and Roman literature through translations and some of the plays uh, they also uh, seem to be uh, have been borrowed from uh, certain other languages. So, he was trying to keep himself abreast with the latest happenings and uh, uh, the knowledgeable things of the times. And uh, uh, last but not the least, one cannot ignore the influence that Elizabethan England had on him because uh, we have noted multiple times that this was a charged and uh, st uh, it was a charged and stimulated atmosphere in uh, uh, London during those times. So he was uh, uh, influenced by all of these things collectively, and it's very difficult to pinpoint what exactly turned this man into uh, a quite an exemplary figure of uh, those times. And uh, Interestingly, though he had performed many plays in London, though he was uh, uh, quite famous, he had taken a name in London as an actor, as a playwright, as a poet, so on and so forth. He himself did not take any kind of effort to get anything published. This, some of them feel perhaps being a successful uh, uh, playwright himself, being a successful uh, uh, person who was putting plays on stage. Maybe he was weary of uh, uh, publishing his plays. There was this risk of piracy because uh, 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 because drama was getting increasingly competitive in uh, England. So everyone had to uh, make sure that their plays remained their own and they were not pirated by someone else. So maybe uh, for this reason, Shakespeare did not actively try to uh, bring out any kind of publication in his name. But there is also this uh, other assumption that. He was too busy staging plays one after the other, preparing the actors and putting the plays on stage that he did not really have the time to sit down and have a proper script. There are a lot of anecdotes about how casually he used to name his uh, plays, how casually he used to uh, frame his scripts. 
so this man had his eye only on the stage and not on the literary things that would go into the pages so in that sense he had never published anything and there are no surviving manuscripts in his own name which is quite ironical and quite strange given the kind of success popularity and fame that he achieved at a later point so uh, how do we access his place so the, some of his friends two of them in particular they had come come out with a collection uh, much after his death this was known as the first uh, folio this is in fact uh, for all shakespeare scholars and all shakespeare lovers this is a very important document because we do not have any other kind of access to the uh, place of shakespeare apart from the fact that they were staged at some point in uh, london so john hemmings and henry condell they were uh, good friends of uh, shakespeare they were also actors and they were part of king's men for a very long time so they knew shakespeare very well and had been a part of uh, most of his uh, dramatic ventures so they brought together in 1623 a collection known as the first uh, folio and uh, one does not know about how original all of these plays were whether they had to uh, they had uh, mended the plays but they had uh, brought about some changes because they had uh, it was all based on the uh, partly from memory partly from the plays which were still being staged so uh, let's not go into those details which is no, which is uh, uh, clearly beyond the scope of our discussion and it's uh, said that uh, in the contemporary only 233 copies of the 750 uh, original uh, first folios are uh, now available rest of them were perhaps lost or uh, some even feel that they could be available in someone's private collections so uh, this is how the first folio the uh, the first page of the folio looked like so if you look at the title uh, it's shakespeare's comedies histories tragedies interestingly this is how the scholarly discussion on Shakespeare's works have been framed as well it is it talks about these three major different genres and this folio in that sense has been a major scholarly framework as well in uh, all the other kinds of uh, discussions on Shakespeare to follow and uh, this uh, uh, portrait of Shakespeare that we find over here this is known as uh, the uh, dreshout portrait because it was made by martin dreshout and this is one of the uh, two portraits which are uh, um, this in fact is one of the two uh, accurate portraits of uh, shakespeare which is available till date and the other one being the uh, his bust which is erected uh, in, in in near his uh, graveyard and uh, this one is said to be accurate because of the assumption that his friends had brought it out and perhaps they could uh, maybe they had found it closer to uh, real life than many other portraits of that time so this is the most accurate and the most uh, uh, trustworthy portrait of uh, shakespeare as we uh, have it today and but at the same time if you uh, just google uh, shakespeare's name you would find that there are different versions and different kinds of portraits which are available so if we talk about this vast corpus of shakespeare's works in uh, in a span of 24 years this is what he had come out with he had two narrative poems to his credit 154 sonnets 37 plays so this is uh, quite a big achievement and some of the field that there are also a few lost plays there are a couple of incomplete ones there are certain plays with uh, shakespeare collaborated with certain others and were not documented so this is a really a vast corpus of work and many historians feel that this is the greatest single body of work available in literature to embark upon a discussion on shakespeare's work we need to devote an entire lecture for that and which is precisely what we are going to do in the next lecture so with this we come to the end of this session thank you for listening and see you in the next class